Welcome to the Super Bold Podcast. I'm Fred Joyle, and today my guest is best-selling author Danielle Sebastian, who has written a book about how you as a spouse can help your partner who is dealing with childhood trauma. I think this is a very powerful topic and everyone's going to find some value here. So let's get right to the episode. We're going to dive right into this because I think there's a lot more people who know that they're experiencing something like this, Danielle, but they don't know what to do about it or even what's happening. So Danielle, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Fred. And I want to thank you as well for your mentorship and your book, which is really helping me be bold and tenacious about getting my story out there. So thank you so much. Yeah. So just so people know, the title of her book, which is if you're looking, you can see it on screen, Resilient Wives, a guide for wives supporting their husband through childhood trauma recovery. Let's let's dive right into, uh, you know, how does this this childhood trauma affect someone in their adult romantic relationships? Essentially, the survival mechanisms that somebody developed to survive a traumatic childhood end up being techniques that don't work very well in adult relationships. And this can really cause a lot of tension and the partner of someone who has experienced childhood trauma feels like it's very unpredictable. There's a lot of emotional minefields. You feel like you're walking on eggshells. And when you really figure out what's going on in a trauma survivor's brain and the techniques that they used in order to cope with their situation, you can get a lot more empathy and you can gain a lot more in your relationship, more stability. And so th basically they've developed survival mechanisms to deal with that trauma that were essential when they were a child. And now they're incredibly detrimental as adults. Absolutely. And what I have found is that often the trauma comes out and is disclosed much later in life, especially in men. And so by the time they're 40, those behaviors and those responses that are just deeply ingrained. And so it's pretty difficult in your you know late 30s and 40s and even in your 50s to create new patterns, but it can be done. Well, we're, men don't like to change. I mean, as speaking as a man, we uh, we come out almost perfect. So, you know, it's it's hard to imagine that anything about us needs to change. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, so, so let's let's find out how how did you get into this? How did this become your topic that that you're helping people with? Well, absolutely. So, twelve years ago, I married my dream guy on a beach in Kauai. And it wasn't long after we were married that I just started noticing some behaviors that I just couldn't understand. I couldn't put my finger on it. I just felt like there was something else going on in the relationship. Uh, a lot of control issues, a lot of emotions that were coming up, behaviors, things that other couples could work through. We were just having difficulty uh, you know, getting, getting through it. And it wasn't until I essentially had had enough and I picked up my two-year-old from preschool and decided to go to my parents' house because I just couldn't handle it anymore. That was when my husband was finally able to reveal for the first time to anyone a terrible history of childhood abuse at the hands of the church. Wow. Okay. So yeah. And you had no idea about this when you married him. I had no idea. No one knew, obviously. No one knew. Yeah. Well, that's, they were very good at keeping that a secret and it's not something you're going to tell anybody about. Um, you're, you're trying to bury it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, uh, so Give so people who are listening and maybe experiencing something in their relationships themselves, uh, get, can you give me an example of of the the behaviors that you thought like where is this coming from, uh, and how to you know and I don't know how to deal with it. 
Absolutely. This is, this is what I wish someone would have told me back, back then when I was struggling is what are some signs that childhood trauma could be behind some of the behaviors that you're seeing. And when I look at some of the signs that I know now, one of them is they don't want to talk about their childhood, right? Seems very natural. You hear a lot of, it was fine. It was very normal. Or I just don't remember much about being a kid. That's a telltale sign. Another sign is a need for control. Because survivors had no control over what happened to them, they will seek control in their lives and in their environment. And when you're dating and you're just first getting to know each other, you may notice and you may have noticed that your husband or your partner or whoever really wants to control the relationship dynamics how close you get, how often you spend time together, whether or not you spend the night at their house or your house. Those are some of those signs of, oh, okay, there might be something back there um, that he needs to feel safe. He needs to feel in control of a situation. And really pushing away is another one. Just when you get close and they pull away, it's because You know, they're letting somebody in. They lost trust with people. They don't trust people. And just when you get close, they'll pull away. Those are some of those telltale signs. Yeah. Getting close is dangerous for them. That's how this happened, most likely. Uh, Now, one of the things that I want to ask, because you're you're giving, giving it from a wife's perspective, but this can go either way. You can be the spouse on, on the other side. You can be a man dealing with a woman's trauma from childhood. And it's the similar telltale signs. They're very similar, very similar signs. Uh, there are some differences. I would say that men in particular, mm-hmm. that obviously it's a much bigger secret. And men usually do not have any sort of very good support to talk deeply about things like this. So there is going to be a lot more difficulty in getting them to tell you what happened. But in that would way, there, it's, it's very similar. Yeah. Would the coping mechanisms be, um, I'm going to throw out the word aggressive, but maybe that's not it. But would a man's coping mechanisms come off as more aggressive than a woman's? I would say definitely lashing out seems to be a more common response in males. But guess what? Just as much the withdrawal and the retreat and the pulling away can be just as detrimental in the relationship. Yeah. So is, is how does how does a, a a spouse who's dealing with this and I'm going to ask you to speak as a wife and and I appreciate that you're talking about your personal story and I appreciate that your husband is is okay with you being open about this um, because this this can help um, thousands and thousands of people I think um, but uh, what do you do what's the pathway to fixing this for someone the re- the first step is understanding the trauma brain 100 percent. you have to understand the why of the behaviors that you're seeing before you can really get to the what you can do about it so that is a hundred percent the first step is understanding what i just talked about some of those signs why they're happening and then getting into, okay, the deep, the deeper seated, what is triggering? What do those behaviors look like? Because once you can identify a trauma trigger, you can separate yourself from those triggers and deal with them head on. What happens in relationships is it feels very blaming and defensive and the partner takes it on. They think it's them. They think they're the problem. And you can see how this just continues to create emotional distress, which is distance and defensiveness. And this cycle goes on and on until something can come in and break that cycle. Yeah, the, and I think this is, this is going a little bit far afield in it, but sometimes the trauma can get repeated, can be passed on to another generation, if it's serious enough, if the person doesn't break that, that 
pathway of trauma, particularly I know in, in examples where uh, men grew up with very violent fathers um, and, and it took everything to control that violence within themselves as they were raising their own children, their own sons in particular. Um, but it's, you have to be conscious of it first and say, wow, this is, this is not even me. I don't even want to be this person, but here I am having this almost uncontrollable reaction. It is uncontrollable. Um, it really is. It's the body's response to a trigger. And in the case of someone who has kept it a secret for 30, 40, 50 plus years, it's unreasonable for us as partners to think that those emotions don't need to come out. That's what I learned the hard way. Those emotions do need to come out. They need to be able to express their anger towards what happened to them. What needs to happen, though, in a relationship is it needs to not come out on you being the punching bag. <laughs> So yes. finding a healthy way for those emotions to come out, which doesn't end up causing more relationship distress is really the key. Yeah. So if I'm hearing this right, which I, I, I believe I understand is that the emotion of, uh, and the anger at the experience and that caused the trauma has to come out and because it doesn't have a straight, healthy way out, it comes out sideways at whoever they're having uh, an intimate relationship. The closer somebody gets, the more they're triggering it, but there's no like obvious connection of why that's being triggered. Absolutely. And I think men in general are, these days, especially have less outlets for huh. emotions. Yeah. They're expected not to show emotion. And that is the hard part. Like, how can we get those emotions out, be able to express anger in a self way, in a safe way? Um, that is the, the key in, in the relationship is being able to do that safely. Yeah, because the, the person is carrying uh, shame about it um, and uh, they, it's, it's a secret, basically. Uh, that they're they're trying to keep um and and they they think that if they just if it just is suppressed they'll be okay because they don't want to appear weak they don't want to appear um helpless or 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 even injured which is what traumatized is you you have been injured um uh, and you know and obviously we know at this point that when you're a child and then that happens, you take on a lot of blame about it happening um, and say, Am I did, if this is my fault even, and I, I what did I do? And, and you, but you're, you don't process it like an adult, you process it like a child. And that's, that's why it gets, it's so deep. And, and I've heard uh, several psychologists say, if, if, if you don't address the trauma, it stays stored in the body somewhere oh yeah the studies completely show and i see it in in my husband and i see it in the other you know sp spouses and and relationships they they seem old <laughs> they have more chronic yeah. illnesses they seem tired um yeah well they're they're dragging these they're chains suppressing, they're suppressing it and yeah. in addition to the anger that needs to come out, guess what? They need to cry for that kid. Yeah. Yeah. They, they need to grieve Please. for what happened to that child. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. Now, one of the things I think people uh, as a spouse might feel is they feel like, oh, well, you know, uh, Am I, am I being selfish? Am I just worrying about myself and, and that this relationship isn't beneficial to me? How, how does somebody, is, is that something they should be feeling or something that they, they need to look at themselves? As with anything related to trauma, it's so complicated. Your feelings as a partner are so complicated because you are, you are feeling guilty for asking for help, for saying that you know, you need support when you see this person in so much pain. 
and you know what they've been through. It feels wrong. It feels wrong to be bringing any of the attention onto yourself. But the bottom line is that this relationship with someone with childhood trauma is different. It requires a team and it requires support both for you and the person who survived it. And by not getting that support, by being exhausted and overwhelmed and not asking for help, I was making it worse. I was more reactive. I couldn't use the techniques that I knew I needed, I should be using because I was, I was so tired. So the bottom line is, is giving yourself some grace to realize it's complicated, but also know it's going to take some different techniques than you need in a lot of other relationships. Yeah. And I think it takes, you know, this, this podcast is about boldness. And I, and to me, this is one of the keys to being bold uh, is to, to be willing to step up instead of running away from problems, whether that's, whether you're the one who's traumatized, you, you have to be bold enough to say, look, I need to fix this. I, you know, I, I can't maintain a relationship. I'm hurting the person I love, or I can't get close enough to actually let someone in, but I have to, I have to be bold enough to be vulnerable, you know, and that's a, that's a big deal to do. And you have to be bold enough to say, I'm going to power through this as the spouse who's dealing with somebody who's de who has this situation as this trauma, you have to be bold enough to say, I, I'm going to find a way through this together. We're going to find a way through this because it's a whole lot easier to walk, isn't it? It would have been easier to walk in most cases, in a lot of cases. Uh, the kids, you know, obviously was a part. I have a whole section, um, you know, a whole book that I refer to about should I stay or should I go? Because everybody's thinking it. Everybody's thinking it. And every situation is different. But I do think that there are there are pros and cons to each. And, you know, if the situation is right, you're right, persevering. And I, I do agree with you that it is bold for someone, a spouse or a partner of someone with childhood trauma, you feel this need to be that support, to put on a, a happy face, to not let everybody know, you know, what's go the chaos that is your life. And it takes a lot of boldness, as you said, to be vulnerable, to tell people, hey, I'm really struggling here. We, I need help. I don't know what I'm doing. And so how do you deal with it? How, what's the process that, that gets you to the other side? I have an entire framework dedicated to that. And I would love to tell you a little bit about it. I already talked about the first one. It's called the CARE Framework. And the C stands for um, comprehending childhood trauma. So as I said, the first step is you got to you gotta start, you know, living in that trauma survivor's brain and really start to see how it's affecting your relationship and separate yourself from those responses. The A in the care is accessing the support you need. So we just talked about that. It's going to take a team. It's going to take a team of support um, in order to get through this. And then the R in the care is resilience building through self-care. You got to figure out how you can get some breaks and take care of yourself so you're not as reactive. And then the E is that is the establishing new, healthier relationship patterns. And that's when you've, you've got the support, you're taking care of yourself, that you can really start to affect those patterns and create new patterns step by step that will then give you the tools to deal with all the triggers. Cause I have to tell you, the triggers will always be there. It's having the tools to be able to deal with them that can really make a big difference. So you have a website called wifecare.com. Yeah. Which is, so the care is, is much more meaningful because it's the framework for, for how you deal with it. Yeah. Um, and it, are there, therapists that specialize in this or is this pretty much uh get a therapist <laughs> get somebody <laughs> i would say for the trauma survivor yeah 
I mean, having a trauma s- specialist that can really help you deal with what would happen to you as a kid, as we just talked about getting those those emotions out and dealing with them in a healthy way is pretty darn important. Um, I've done couples counseling. I've done individual counseling. Um, I, I've done it all. Uh, but I will say that a lot of the communication techniques that were told to me, i.e. the love languages, um, going on date nights, a lot of those things did not work for me and the people that I that I support in this Um, In particular, the love languages, for example, those love languages are all about how someone responds and likes to experience love, right? A childhood trauma survivor, that was so screwed up for them. They have no idea what a healthy response is or what they would have initially responded to love like. And so you are not going to have success in your relationship with love languages with somebody who just cannot even understand what that means. So that's just one little example where um, there there is some differences. There are some nuances um, that need to be different. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting because that's gasoline on the fire yes. rather than, yeah. It's triggering. Yeah, because it's more it, triggering. That's, yeah, it's <laughs> right, right. It's, it's actually... <laughs> That's that's what that may have been how the the abuse started, even, yep. you know, um, so, uh, yeah, these things with, that the normal things that couples are trying to fix. And the other thing is, it's not like you're whole and normal and everything's fine emotionally about you. You, you nobody grows up uh, unharmed by by their parents and, and other people who who have affected their lives. So you're you're we're we're all flawed human beings trying to find our way um so it, it's like you got to find things in yourself don't you to to say okay he's triggering something in me now too it may not be as trauma based but it's like this is this is i don't react well to this 100% it brings out <laughs> all of your past, all of your demons as well. And it's going to take everything to really make it all mesh together. So it's a a double exorcism, basically. (laughs) Yeah. So So, um, how is your husband now? He's great. He's great. You know, I, I realized it. Um, it was a couple years ago, and that's when I had the idea for the book, really, was we woke up one morning. We had kids' activities in a town a little bit far away, so we rode up. We, we woke up early. We got our coffees in the car. We all loaded up. The two kids were in the back. I was sitting next to my husband. We had our sunglasses on and our coffee, and we came over this hill, and we saw this amazing sunset. And that was the most calm and happy we've felt in years. And that's when I realized, hey, I think we did this. I think that no matter what comes our way, we got this. We can deal with this. We have the tools to do this. And we're happy. Yeah. So the most powerful message that any of my listeners can have is there you can get to the other side of this. And that person that you love is never going to get around no. this. It, they're never, there's, they're, they're not going to self heal this or make this go away or just ignore it. And, and that you're just going to be able to love bomb them enough where this problem just goes away. It, the only way through is through. It is not a marathon with an end. <laughs> With the final, you know, with the flag that you go through in the end, it's a marathon, um, but it'll always be there. And the thing that I've really also experienced is that once you develop these tools, new challenges will occur, new stages of life will occur. So for example, we have a teenager and guess what? My husband's losing a lot of control. (laughs) And guess what? Brand new triggers are coming to play and we're going back to the old tool set. So, but yeah, but at least, at least you can say, 
What do you think, honey? Think might be uh, triggering something about control. Exactly. And, and, you know, you've got the new love language, which is like, this is happening, isn't it? This is like, we're, we're, this is emerging and he can just cop to it and go, yeah. So, so I think that this is the kind of thing I think people really struggle in the marriage was like, how private do you keep this? Um, because I think this like, they may want you to know it and the therapist to know it, but letting anybody else know, is that, does that perpetuate the problem in some way? Or is, or is there a way to just say, this is us, this is our little safe world? Yeah, it, I really think it depends. Obviously, I'm, not everybody is going to be where me and my husband are, right? Telling the world. Yeah. A lot of people won't. Um, and that is 100% fine. But uh, there are ways to maintain the privacy of what your husband needs and still get the support you need. And that requires, which is tough, but communication. So having that discussion, that tough discussion with your husband about, hey, you know, I know you only want to tell me um, and never and just deal with it with us forever, but I can't do it. I don't have the tools, but I want you to be in on whoever I'm going to bring into this. I want us to have a safe space that you feel comfortable with me telling our story. That's the key. Wow. Yeah, I can see that being a, a very important part of this and a very loving thing to do uh, for, for somebody who's going through it because they have to feel like, I, I, I'm not ready to broadcast this. Uh, I, I'm. I've been suppressing it from myself, uh, never mind telling anybody else. Um, and like I said, a lot of shame, a lot of embarrassment, a lot of uh, guilt, even that's wrapped up in this and almost in an extreme way, more than more than most people experience about stuff. Um, so how can somebody get this fabulous book of yours? Oh, it is uh, on Amazon. Absolutely. hundred percent on Amazon. Go and grab it and check out my website if you want to get deeper. And I have an entire free download about those signs that I was talking about that you can go through and see if this might be something that's occurring in your relationship. Yeah. So it's, it's wifecare.com and it's, Dan it's uh, Danielle Sebastian.com. Oh, it's Danielle Sebastian.com. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. It's wifecare.org. That's the organization. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Danielle Sebastian.com. That'll be in the show notes as well. Yes. But it's one of those names that you spell it just like you think yep. you would. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and the book is Resilient Wives, and it is available on Amazon. Um, Danielle, this I think is such a great thing that you've dedicated your life and time to, to help people through this. And uh, I'm very happy for you and your husband that uh, you have come out the other side of this and develop the skills and the language to deal with this um, and, and can be such an example and inspiration to people. So Thank you for being on the podcast. I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much um, for really asking such amazing questions and helping me get my story out. Yes. And so uh, let's get this out for sure. And uh, everyone, this is the Super Bold podcast. This is uh, about boldness when it matters most. And I can't think of any situation where it would matter more than making your spouse healthier and dealing with intense trauma that they may be experiencing because the only way that they're going to have full, happy, loving lives is, is if they can heal this and it's going to take support. And if you can be that person in their life, that would be an amazing thing that I think you'll be gratified the rest of your life about. So thank you, Danielle. Thank you. And, uh, We'll see you all soon.